morning, everyone. Oh, thank you for making it out here. Uh, welcome to Hyperledger Global Forum 2020. Uh, I know that this is an especially challenging time to be traveling, so I really appreciate the effort that everyone has made to make it here. Uh, uh, we have an amazing show lined up for you. Uh, first, uh, if you do plan to tweet uh, or share anything on social media, the hashtag is hashtag Hyperledger Global Forum. Uh, just put that out there. Um, we've got an amazing event. We have over 100 speakers across 80 different sessions uh, over the next four Four days. Uh, we've got uh, soon. You'll hear uh, some amazing keynotes this morning from Rob Polotnick, uh, the uh, chairman of our governing board and, and uh, head of blockchain projects at DTCC. You'll hear from uh, David Treat, uh, who runs all of the blockchain initiatives uh, for Accenture. And there's an amazing panel put together by Michael Del Castillo from Forbes of uh, a whole bunch of companies that are putting this into production and making it work. Uh, uh, and then tomorrow morning, uh, we've got keynotes from Sheila Warren at the World Economic Forum. Uh, the WEF is doing a huge number of uh, blockchain projects in all sorts of different domains, from central banks uh, to a bill of rights for blockchain users, all sorts of fun stuff that you'll be hearing about tomorrow. Um, from Arno, uh, uh, the head of our technical steering committee, he'll give you kind of an update on the technical community side, uh, as well as from Don Tapscott. Um, uh, but beyond the, the keynotes, we've got all sorts of sessions that go into depth on all the different projects at Hyperledger, uh, go into all sorts of different use cases, for, uh, our special interest groups, all sorts of really fun things. We have also an amazing uh, sponsor showcase uh, uh, next door that uh, we see uh, and be able to talk to many of the companies putting this technology into practice, uh, as well as see posters from uh, many of the mentees uh, and the mentorship and our mentorship program from this last year uh, will be over there as well. Um, we also have lightning uh, talks from uh, many of our projects and SIGs so that if you, there's a project at Hyperledger or some initiative you didn't really know anything about or much about, you'll be able to immerse in that really quickly. Um, and then, of course, we've got some really fun evening events. Uh, tonight, uh, a booth crawl uh, in the sponsor showcase um, leading up to a meetup for the local uh, Arizona, local, local Phoenix Hyperledger community. Um, so the, the public will be invited to that. It'll be pretty fun. And then tomorrow night, we're heading out to a, a, an interestingly named uh, Dude Ranch, uh, I won't repeat it here, um, uh, uh, where we'll be able to listen to mariachi music and fly in a hot air balloon. So uh, uh, lots of fun things planned over the next few days. In short, you will get FOMO. Uh, that's okay. Uh, just breathe. You can always catch uh, the talks later. Um, the, uh, every talk uh, in, our, in our tracks are being recorded, um, and we'll be putting them up online as soon as we can, because we know there are many people who weren't able to make it here. Uh, I, and what you won't be able to do later uh, are uh, make connections with people who are here, right? Uh, to reconnect with old friends, perhaps, uh, uh, to uh, meet uh, new collaborators, perhaps people you've only ever seen in a Zoom channel, um, uh, uh, their name, oh, you're that person, okay, great. Um, uh, or even meet brand new people. Um, in fact, that's really the best use of your time, meeting other community members here, uh, perhaps especially those in completely other projects than yours, completely other fields of endeavor. I guarantee you that every pairwise combination of identities out there, um, that's an indie joke for any of you who get that, um, uh, will be able to find something of interest and you'll both be richer for it. You'll hear a lot of updates from the Hyperledger community uh, this week as well. Um, more about new software projects, uh, new indicators of our growing footprint, new participants in our ecosystem. Just this past year, <clears throat> over 60 different companies joined the, the Hyperledger uh, community, uh, including Microsoft, uh, including Salesforce, Tech Mahindra, a very large uh, uh, BPO based in India. Um, and also, this morning, I'm pleased to announce uh, that this morning, uh, we, uh, Walmart has joined uh, the Hyperledger community. So we're really excited about this and you'll listen and, and you'll hear from Archana uh, uh, later on the panel. Um, uh, <clears throat> we also saw a consensus not only rejoin Hyperledger, a consensus as a company was part of the original cohort of companies that started the Hyperledger project uh, at its first announcement in December of 2015. They came back in as a premier member, took a seat on our governing board, and brought with them a code base that they had been developing that has become Hyperledger Bezu. Uh, so you'll be hearing a lot more about that over the next few days uh, and a lot of other great news uh, uh, as well. But let me kind of put out there, why, why are we here? I mean, aside from the mariachi music, uh, aside from kind of catching up with old friends. 
During my career, there's, uh, I've been influenced by a lot of different people out there, but I'd say one person who's really deeply inspired me uh, has been uh, Tim O'Reilly. Uh, Tim O'Reilly, he really understood uh, and helped translate and empower the burgeoning open source community, um, even starting back in 1997 when he put together the first uh, Perl conference. Does anyone remember the programming language Perl? Um, uh, it's, I, I'm sure it's still more widely used than COBOL, and I still dream in Perl more than any other language. Um, and he said two things um, back then and kind of early on that I want each of you to kind of internalize uh, and think about how it might apply not only to Hyperledger, but your involvement in Hyperledger. One of them was create more value than you capture, right? Um, and this is in some ways the essence of open source software. You know, you're writing code, you're putting it out there, uh, you're collaborating with others, but you're, you're reaching beyond kind of your own self-interest, right? Think of the ways in which the work you do not only it can not only solve a problem for yourself, but solve problems for others as well. And then help them find that solution. It's not just enough to check in code and hope that somebody finds it. Right? You've got to be an advocate for it. So this is partly about mentorship and advocacy, but it's also about accepting that pull request from a newbie right? uh, or giving them feedback and encouragement on how to improve that pull request. It's about creating, when you have a disagreement, a technical disagreement with somebody about the right way to solve a problem, it's about creating an abstraction layer so you can let them go and play on the other side of a safe API <laughs> uh, and see if that idea has merit, not just shut them down and tell them that's, that's no good. It means it's okay to profit from this. It's okay to start a business. It's okay to like make money. I mean, that's, that's why a lot of us are here or can afford to be here, right? Um, and it's okay to be focused on your own personal kind of agenda and your priorities uh, and client commitments. We all have those, right? But your project won't succeed if it's not also pulling in people with different priorities and ideas. Um, and if you focus just on, on uh, if you focus on the kinds of roadmap work and documentation, developing samples, et cetera, that can unlock doors for others to walk through, then rather than just rather than just marking a feature request completed, you'll eventually see that payback in greater not only users but more contributors and eventually more maintainers and more activity at the core of your project and eventually greater velocity. For, for the project. This is really important for us to get right at Hyperledger. We really have to just think, how do we create more value than any of us as individuals capture um, from our involvement? The second thing is work that, that Tim O'Reilly said that, that really influenced me was work on things that matter. Right, now that sounds like trivial in retrospect. Nobody thinks that they work on things that don't matter, right? But what we're building here at Hyperledger, the, uh, it, it really does matter in a way that's very different from the way that containerization matters or NoSQL matters or other kinds of technology waves matter, Rust matters. You know, those do matter in their own ways, right? Um, What's different here is, is that the world is changing in ways that are, I think a lot of us are grappling with, you know, whether it's the most recent news or things that have been trends for us for the last 10 years, right? The world is losing trust in itself, losing trust in its own ability to solve big problems, to solve small problems. Um, you know, you've seen the, the trust barometer that Edelman puts out, for example. You've seen, uh, I, 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 you know, lots of these questions about how do we, how do we uh, you know, solve some of these issues? The, the sustainable development goals, for example, um, feel sometimes impossibly idealistic, right? Um, and I think we're seeing central institutions really start to strain under the burden of these really large macro kinds of changes, right? From the changes in the environment, the changes in the decline of, middle, of the middle class, all these kinds of challenges as we've, we've developed a society that's more simultaneously more integrated and more globalized, and yet feels more dispersed and, and less coordinated than ever before. Um, we're also losing that sense of resiliency, right? As we've pursued this kind of uh, uh, primary objective of optimization uh, and, and cutting the fat and cutting the, the, the inventory, cutting the, the kind of uh, uh, slack, as they say, right, uh, at, at, at steps in our supply chain, at steps in our, our, our world, um, we're, we're losing our resiliency to kind of these, these, these events that can happen, right? Um, uh, the trendy term might be the anti-fragility uh, of our systems uh, is, is really, really a threat. Um, and Web 2.0, again, kind of a movement that Tim uh, popularized uh, and a lot of us got really excited about at the dawn of kind of the cloud era, right? It was really implicit in that philosophy was trust the servers, right? We're not evil. They're not evil. Trust the servers. Tr put data in, pull data out through APIs, build this interconnected web, but still fundamentally trust the people and trust the institutions behind those APIs. Um, that worked. That scales like crazy, right? We did, but it also kind of got us to where we are now, 
Um, there is a paper uh, that was written uh, about two years ago that uh, I really like and I'd recommend. Mike Masnick, uh, uh, who is an editor for a publication called Tech Dirt, wrote a paper called Protocols, Not Platforms, where he really di dove into the fact that you know, we kind of gave up on distributed social networking protocols. We kind of gave up on uh, Usenet. Does anyone remember Usenet? Uh, I, I say anyone who doesn't remember Usenet is kind of doomed to reinvent it from time to time. Um, <clears throat> But uh, he really helped crystallize, I think, for a lot of us, this sense that we should be thinking again about these underlying wiring protocols and how to build build a, a web, get back to a, a web rather than something that is at its heart a, a star a star network, right? Um, and you don't really have to be a crypto anarchist to see that we need ways to validate what we think are true, right? We need ways to build uh, greater decentralization, right? And I won't say full decentralization, I don't even know what that, that word really means because nothing in the world is fully decentralized, but this idea of minimum viable centralization. How do we achieve with just enough lightweight coordination at the core something that unlocks value and unlocks resiliency around the network? That's still, I think, at the heart of what we're building. That's still at the heart of distributed ledgers and smart contract systems. We need a way to be able to do business with each other and build these networks that don't require us having to trust uh, uh, somebody at the center for, simply because they were there first, right? Central services mandate trust, and, they mandate, and mandated trust isn't really trust at all. It's just obedience. These systems, our systems that we're building, I think, embody a trust but verify concept at their core. We still have to have market enablers. We still need governing authority type organizations, right? Um, but, <clears throat> but if we can push transaction finality and non-repudiation um, uh, into the network rather than trapped inside of a box that one person or one organization has control over, um, this solves whole categories of problems that we're really just starting to scratch the surface of. And, and these problems that we're solving are, 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 are in a lot of, so many different domains. You're going to hear this week about a lot of these. You'll hear more about the, how blockchain technology is remaking the pharmaceutical supply chain, right? There's a space where you have lots of parties who don't trust each other enough to let one party Party, run, run the server that keeps track of where every package of a drug goes from source to destination, right? The, that's an industry that is working together now to, to figure out how do we do this distributed ledger to trace um, where these packages flow and get uh, uh, just greater trust in the system by doing that. You'll hear more about circular supply chain kinds of initiatives, kind of the stuff you saw in that Accenture video, which is an awesome video, isn't it? Right? Um, and all that work, by the way, that they're doing is on Hyperledger Fabric and the circular supply chain initiatives. But you'll hear others around battery traceability uh, and, and, and other products that, uh, that are now being traced using, using blockchain technology. You'll hear about digital identity initiatives, right? Uh, not just in, in the developed world, uh, whether in healthcare, whether in government IDs, or uh, uh, in, in other places. You'll, you'll hear about it as well in the developing world. Um, Kiva, for example, the project that they're working on with Sierra Leone on digital identity. I mean, this is solving a deep problem where, you know, government-issued digital identity is, there's a short path between that and tyranny, as, as has been proven over the last hundred years. Like, we need to be careful about how that works and the way that we've done that with self-sovereign ID and with using uh, uh, blockchain technology, I think is the path against that, uh, to protects us from that. You'll also hear more about a special interest group that we launched uh, uh, just about a month ago called uh, the Climate Accountability Special Interest Group, which is all about figuring out how do we get the network of researchers out there looking at how we um, account for the emissions of carbon, uh, uh, the uh, uh, you know planting of trees, how much does that create a carbon sink, right? Um, how do we create a, a trustworthy system that is international in scope can actually give us a shot at achieving uh, the climate accord, accords uh, in uh, the Paris Accords, sorry, uh, and others. How do we put those pieces together? How do we map up the plumbing and the, and the building blocks that we build at Hyperledger to go and meet that challenge? Um, essentially behind every single one of these sustainable development goals, these SDGs, and there's like 250 odd of them organized into 16 or 17 different uh, uh, categories. Go look them up, they're all really interesting. Behind each one of them is a number. Right behind each one of them is a metric. You know the the number of girls that are educated uh, in in a country. The uh, does everybody have a verifiable uh, identity, digital or otherwise? Um, uh, are are we solving the food insecurity crises that uh, are plaguing us globally? Um, behind every one of these is a metric, and if there's a metric, there's a system of account. And if there's a system account, if it's going to be a global system, it's probably going to be a distributed ledger behind that. 
this is what gets at least me up in the morning, um, and I think a lot of my staff, and I think a lot of you, right, is, okay, potentially accelerating things in the financial sector, making certain processes that we have to live with these days less bureaucratic, more efficient, but it's really this chance to have an impact on the planet that I think very few of us have otherwise uh, that really drives a lot of us. So no other technology family really gives us what DLT and smart contracts give us, a better and safer, safer way to continue to digitize the systems of the world. This is what has to be our true north. This is why, why we're here, I think, why we're doing this, not just to use a blockchain to do what you could use a database for. Getting these systems embedded into the financial systems of the world is key to normalizing it, is key to making it uh, uh, something that everybody can turn to and understand how, how they work, which is why it's been great to see the financial sector embrace this technology, because that's, that's critical. But we need to collaborate to get there, and we need to work fast. I have a theory that in every industry, there's a window of opportunity to get these systems in. Um, a window before every market segment basically becomes Uber. Um, or, you know, only a little bit better becomes Uber versus Lyft, right? A, a duopoly if we're lucky. We have a window of time to get decentralized distributed information systems in place that place the network effects of a consortium over the efficiency of a central information platform provider. Um, this is why it's critical to do this in healthcare, in uh, all sorts of supply chain traceability projects, but also in academic credentials and digital identity, also in all these other domains you're seeing it. This is what the next few days are really about. How do we take advantage of this window of time? How do we build the best plumbing we need, but then, uh, and quickly, uh, so that we and others can move up the stack and really get to starting to solve real problems out there. So I challenge each of you to find um, at least three sessions over the next few days um, uh, where you know nothing about what's being talked about. Um, go in, immerse. Uh, if it makes sense, great. Even if it doesn't, fine. Um, and then also go to one session where you think you already know everything about it and don't need to go, because uh, I bet there's something you'll find out. And, and look for a way to not only get the answers you need uh, and the tools and skills to solve problems for yourselves and, and your employers and all that kind of stuff, but look for a way to pay it forward. Look for a way to create more value than you can capture, uh, to climb that ladder of contribution or knowledge, but also extend a hand backwards to the next person coming up behind you. Um, or improve the ladder itself. It's just software, it's processes, we can do this. So before we move on uh, this morning, uh, I'd like to remind you we have a code of conduct uh, for the event. It's posted on the event website, it's also on the Hyperledger website. Um, we have a firm policy that all are welcome at in the Hyperledger community. If you see anything here at the event that strikes you as kind of uh, speaking against that, please let me or one of the Hyperledger staff know, uh, and, and we'll get on it. Um, or the Linux Foundation staff, uh, and we'll, we'll attend to it. Given the recent news as well, we'd like to remind folks to take some extra precautions um, with your health while you're here, uh, washing your hands frequently, practicing the elbow or the ankle bump. Um, I, I, I like the ankle bump thing. It's a kid and play reference. Um, I, I, and uh, uh, maintaining safe distances, especially while talking. I know that in noisy environments, it can be a little bit hard to hear somebody, and your temptation is to, like yell in their ear. I just go outside, find a quiet place, and, and it'll all be good. Um, now I'd like to introduce you to uh, Rob Palatnik. Rob is the chairman of the board of the of Hyperledger Governing Board. Um, so he's one of my 26 bosses. Um, uh, he's been a really fierce advocate for Hyperledger since before I joined. Um, and he leads a company that I hadn't heard of before getting involved in Hyperledger, and I bet many of you still might not know, uh, called DTCC. Uh, DTCC kind of is at the center of an industry tracking trillions of dollars worth of assets, basically every stock in every public company on the planet. Um, and he He's, uh, uh, he does a number of different things for DTCC, but he oversees their move to replacing the centralized server that they have at the core of settlement of you know, where these stocks lie um, into a distributed ledger platform. Um, and so with that, I'd like to welcome to the stage Rob Palatnik. <laughs> 